Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. Call InventHelp today. To get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-352-1609. That's 1-800-352-1609. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino, and how to get the money you need when you need it, simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 52security.com. That's the number 52security.com. 52security.com. Go to 52security.com. Hurt or injured in a car accident? It can be hard to take the proper legal action after a car accident, but waiting can cost you more. The law requires car accident victims to assert claims promptly. You could lose out by simply waiting. Call 800-709-4667 right now to see what your claim could be worth when handled by a skilled attorney. With a lawyer fighting and speaking up for you, you could be entitled to a big cash award. Call 800-709-4667. That's 800-709-4667. Now it's fast and easy to connect with the legal help you need after your car accident. Call 800-709-4667. The call is free, but you need to act now before time runs out on your claim. You need a lawyer to fight for you, protect you, and get you the compensation you need and deserve. Time's wasting. Call 800-709-4667. That's 800-709-4667. Call now. I considered suicide so I wouldn't put my family through all the pain. Many of our warriors are returning home from the battlefield only to face a new war. As they struggle with devastated injuries. At Wounded Warrior Project, we understand. We're there to help. Even though you think you're broken, you're not. It's the physical and the emotional healing that Wounded Warrior Project provides. With a gift of just $19 a month, you can join Wounded Warrior Project. You'll help provide critically needed programs and services that rebuild lives. Beautiful! <laughs> The ongoing needs of our wounded and their families will continue for many years to come. Now is the time to show your support. Call now or go online with your gift of just $19 a month and we'll send you this Wounded Warrior Project blanket. It made me feel that there's people out there that care about us. After this event, we can finally maybe start to heal as a family and move forward. We need your help. The families are hurting. For many of our wounded heroes, the greatest casualty is being forgotten. That's why your gift of just $19 a month is so important. Please call or go online right now. Daenerys Targaryen. She says she is the mother of dragons. But would you trust her with your kids? Her father was a maniac. She palled around with Dothraki terrorists. She asked the city of Karth for a government bailout. Then she lost three baby dragons after placing them in an unlocked wooden box. An unlocked wooden box. This Khaleesi wants to be queen of the Seven Kingdoms, but can she be trusted? Daenerys Targaryen. Wrong for dragons. Wrong for the realm. Paid for by the committee to protect dragons. We don't know anything about him. He was never really vetted. Is he really the true-born son of Robert Baratheon? 
All over the Seven Kingdoms, people are asking the same question. Who is the real King Joffrey? The people of Westeros are hurting. Winter is coming. Crop yields are falling. And the price of fuel is going up. The cost of peat moss is through the thatched roof. And this young and inexperienced king takes advice from a whoremongering imp and has launched an illegal war in the north. What is King Joffrey hiding? This is not our kind of family values. King Joffrey, what a bastard. What a bastard. Paid for by the Young Baratheons for freedom. Rob Stark, he's the biggest celebrity in the North. But his father was a traitor. He arrested his own mother. His bastard brother deserted the Night's Watch. And he couldn't defend his own castle. Zinc Media. Feel the power of knowledge. from my Bunker Eyes home studio, somewhere within the great granite state of New Hampshire, where the state motto is, yes, and I checked again today, as I do every day, it is still live free or die, it is not big government or bust, absolutely not. It is Thursday, Thursday, May the 7th, in the year of our Lord, 2015, and up here in New England, we had another beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, the temperatures are still high and um, a little b- above normal. And I know that's got all the global warming idiots out there just jumping for joy. See, the planet is warming up, folks, because we've had a few days above normal. Uh, one thing that is kind of interesting today is that we had this. Um, uh, today I heard the news that, that, that an, a higher pollen count is also due to man-made global climate change. Yeah, so you people who are suffering from allergies from the higher count in pollen up here on the East Coast, uh, just know that it's it's global climate change. That's it's not it's not because we had a long hard winter and a late blooming spring. Oh no 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 that 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 can't be it. It's it's due to climate change. Uh, we are going to switch things up a little bit here this evening. Yes, we're going to start the show off. I know for you, those of you who've been listening since 2009, you know this is way different. I rarely do this. Starting off the program tonight, I have a guest, a special guest. Uh, Marie Strouder is with us in the house. I was uh, on her show a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, basically, she's a, she's a rabble-rousing woman. Uh, she's the uh, uh, activist mom turned co-founder of African-American conservatives and is the opinionated, no holds barred host of African-American conservatives radio show over on the blog talk radio network and, uh, from the, uh, the right radio network. Uh, she, she, let, let, let me tell you something. This lady knows what she's talking about. She's, uh, she's been able to, to chat with and have people on her show like Carl Rose, Steve Forbes, Michelle Malkin. Uh, Representative uh, uh, Michelle Bachman, Alan West, for all you Alan West lovers out there. Yeah, she's, uh, she's, she's got an inside track to Mr. West. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, Ambassador Bolton. Yeah, that John Bolton. Newt Gingrich and Senator Jim DeMint, just to name a few. Marie, are you there? I'm here, Rod. Welcome to the show. How are you this evening? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. 
I'm glad that you were able to take some time out of your busy, busy day and uh, busy life to come on over to my little program here and entertain me and my guest, uh, me and my uh, listeners over here. Uh, by the way, folks, if you wish to call the show and talk to me or Marie while she's here, the number is toll free 603 835 3224. And uh, hopefully my, my technology will not war against me tonight and we'll make sure that everything is copacetic and works well. Uh, so if you got questions, for, especially for me, feel free to give us a buzz, 603-835-3224. Marie, now I know that you, you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening. And we know we got two big-time stories happening out there that, that the press just seems to be all over because they don't want to focus in on Hillary Clinton or, or Obama and what they're doing. Uh, but instead, they want to focus on, um, on Baltimore. And recently, the past couple of days, it's been what's happened in Texas. Now, there's a conservative woman that was being threatened, and, and they were trying to attack and kill her. And some of the people, even some people surprisingly on the right, seem to be saying that there are limits to free speech and that she should have known better and she shouldn't have done that. Now, I don't know about you, but as a, as a woman who believes in conservative values and free speech, what do you think about that? Well, you know, I've heard about the story with Pamela Geller and what's going on in Texas and Garland. And, you know, it was funny, there's a meme going around right now on Twitter where they're talking about, you know, is the pencil cartoon provocative and the meme is showing uh, planes going into the World Trade Center, and they're saying, no, actually, this is provocative. And they're absolutely right. That's what's provocative here. So, again, it is just to detract people from what's really going on, just like you said uh, earlier, that you know people want to talk about Hillary Clinton and they want to talk about these other things when the real story is, you know, they want to talk about Baltimore when the real story is, you know, don't look at the man behind the curtain. We want you to look at this thing over here. And we really do need to look at what the bigger issues are here. ISIS is here in the United States. We're talking about the 15 target that they, they're talking about right now. So, yeah, this is a big story. We need to be talking about this. So let's talk about what the real issue is. You know, it, it is, yeah. I'm sorry. Speaking of the uh, the uh, the ISIS and the 15 states that they're that they say they're going to be targeting uh, today across the um, the internet world in on certain places, I noticed that there were some people. Uh, now again, I don't know why this is the case and why people are burying their head in the sand, but uh, they were discounting this story simply because. Fox first broke it. I uh, broke the news. Fox News. Forget the fact that you know that the, that the other news outlets have picked up the story and they're running with it too. But the, what they were saying is, "Oh, come on! Are, are you going to believe Fox News? I, are, are are we? Have we gotten to the point where we are so uh, unsympathetic and we're so partisan, even in our news coverage and who's covering the news, that we will automatically discount uh, for the moderates and on the left Fox News just because Fox News?" broke a story that now other networks are breaking? Well, let's look at Peter Schweitzer, right? He's a conservative, and he broke this news about Hillary Clinton and the uranium, right? And he's been the darling of the conservative media, but the other news outlets picked up the story, and they're hot on the trail, and they have verified it, and they've looked at the facts, and they said, yes, indeed, that this, there is something here. So just because Fox News may have broke something, just because uh, a conservative may have said something, doesn't mean that that's not true. So people can independently verify something and find out that it is, in fact, true. So let's not look at where the source may be. Let's look, is there actual news there? Is there a fire? Is there a smoking gun? And if there is, let's not look at where it came from. Let's look at, is there something to pursue here? And if there is, let's make it known. And... As you said, there is something here. There are 15 targets. Let's talk about what we're going to do about that. Yeah, you know, the, uh, ISIS is claiming that there are 71 uh, soldiers, if you will. Soldiers uh, ready uh, to be trained. Yeah, they're trained and they're ready to go. Now, one of the things that, this, that, that some people are missing um, on this point is that ISIS says that there are 71 soldiers here, ISIS soldiers here in the States. Mm -hmm. Now, what they seem to have failed to forget is a story a couple of weeks ago that even I talked about was that uh, they found Mexicans, Mexican government found 
a terrorist camp in Mexico just eight miles away from Eight border, miles south, yes. And they believe it was an ISIS terrorist training camp. So, they're, you know, the Mexicans are telling us that, that, look, this is probably not the only terrorist camp that's on our, you know, our side of the border down here, but we found one for you. So now we've got people that are discounting this ISIS terror threat when we've got, you know, easily, they can easily walk over the border just eight miles away. Um, there's, a, there's a terror training camp. I, what is going on in this country that we're trying to bury our... Is it really because Obama won't come out and say a terrorist is a terrorist? Well, that's one issue, Rod. One is that he will not label terrorism for what it is. It's workplace violence. It is any number of things other than what it is. I don't think he's even labeled this last thing in Garland, Texas as terrorism yet. Uh, So that is one issue. The other issue is our porous border. The fact that he will not, he's got this blanket amnesty program. DACA is a mess. All of this is a huge issue, but yet we've not closed this border. That's the other issue. For a very long time, we've talked about Mexican drug cartels and all of this stuff on the border. But for a very, very long time, my show's been on air for six years and I've long talked about the fact that I'm not as worried about the Mexican drug cartels and the human trafficking. Those are very bad things. Don't get me wrong, but I've long talked about we're in a post nine one one society. I mean, post uh, nine 11. Yeah. A post nine 11 society. Let's be talking about the other people that can get in here. Let's talk about terrorism and how easily it is to get across. We don't check visas, who's here that shouldn't be here. We don't have any kind of mechanism for any of that. And so we need to be looking at those kinds of things, not just the tra- trafficking and the, the drug trade. So, yeah, so because we have this, this wide open southern border, and, 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 and then whenever you have a particular state like Arizona or Texas who tries to move to close it, they get, they get sued by our they current get sued by our government. Yeah. department. Uh, yeah, so so this whole it's kind of it's not surprising that there was an attempted attack down. Well, it's not even an attempt. They succeeded in attacking. The only the only problem for them was that nobody but the two who were attacking ended up dying. Um, I, I don't know if that if the if the administration is going to assume that a, a, an attack it's going to be an attack if an American dies versus it not being an, an attack because an American doesn't die. But, but there was a police officer that was shot and injured. Um, so I consider it to be a success for their part because they've done, they've done the damage. Now, now they've scared us to death. And now we're talking about, you know, curtailing freedom of speech rights. You know, we shouldn't talk about Islam this way because it, it's so provocative. We, we know it's going to piss them off, so we shouldn't talk about it. But, but on the other hand, it's okay that if we denigrate Christianity... I don't understand where this, this type of notion... Is it because that we are really becoming that scared? or we become the United States of scaredy cats? Well, we're politically correct, Rod. That's the issue. And I think part of it is because the mantra that they believe is that Christians are supposed to be kind and turn the other cheek. They, they, they see the Jesus that is portrayed in the Bible of, uh, they, they equate it uh, that meekness is a doormat, but what the word meek means is strength under control. That's what the Greek word means, strength under control. They don't see the Jesus that overturns the money changer's table, you know, uh, standing up for what you believe in. And so I guess they think that we're just a bunch of doormats and that we won't stand up for what we believe in. Uh, so it's kind of this politically correct environment where when you see people being beheaded, when you see a group of people who have a religious belief that will stand up for their religious beliefs, you know, regardless of how misguided we may feel those religious beliefs are when we talk about this extreme faction of uh, Islam, they will stand up for their beliefs. They will say that we think that this is such and such and that we believe this and we should have Sharia law and we should have this. They will say under no circumstances do we believe that this is acceptable. And they will say that. 
But Christians, on the other hand, are maybe not as vocal as we should be. And I think that that's a mistake for us to not be as vocal as we ought to be. We don't vote uh, for things the way we ought to vote for things, and we are not as vocal for things as we ought to be. And I think that's where we have been mistaken at times. And we need to be a lot more proactive about that, and we need to vote more in that way. And, And I think maybe it's because... We have been so divided about candidates, perhaps, and and I know that's a hard issue sometimes because we have a lot of litmus tests, and and that's a difficult place to be sometimes, and I'm not saying that um, we need to be lax on one issue or another issue, but if you look on, I don't want to say us and them, but it really is, you know, there's only one Democrat candidate right now that's announced. We expect that there'll be others, but so far there's only been one that's enough. And we have how many, four or five that have been announced on the Republican side. That's yeah. difficult, you know? Huckabee makes six uh, from his uh, announcement yeah. yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and well, speaking of of voting and, and, and having Democrat candidates, we've noticed that you know it seems like the democrats are kind of they're trying to pull away from hillary a little bit but they don't have any anybody in there that they think can actually uh pony up to the bar so to speak Uh, i mean elizabeth warren seems like she's gotten cold feet and is backing away now she may change her mind later on but right now it looks like she's backing uh backing out and uh, of possibly being a contender and that leaves people you know like lincoln chafee who's he's he's really a very weak candidate, and the Democrats know that, so they're not all excited that, that he might be interested. Uh, they got Bernie Sanders, but you know, Bernie Sanders is more like a spoiler for Hillary than, any, than a real contender. Um, you know, He's kind of like Ross Perot to George H.W. Bush, yeah. uh, but not nearly as popular. Um, but there's a lot of things that Hillary's running around talking about and trying to talk about now, and one of those things is, you know, there's a there's a video that's resurfacing it with her grinding and dancing, you know, with a, with a bl- bunch of black women. And she she actually talked about a little bit about what happened in Baltimore. And now, as you know, we've got, you know, uh, Loretta Lynch is in Baltimore and trying yeah. to see what she can do to, to help out the problem. Um, but she talked about that. Uh, the very policies that her husband put in place. Now, she didn't say her husband put these in place, but the very policies that her husband put in place w- was the problem. But if you look at Baltimore, Baltimore is a predominantly black populated city that is predominantly run by black uh, officials, and yet everybody's screaming that there's systemic racism in Baltimore. And it's due to uh, it's due to, to certain policies that black people in Baltimore, black leaders, have put in place. So why is it a white person's fault? What happens in Baltimore? Well, but that's just the Democrat way, isn't it? I mean, it's George W. Bush's fault. I mean, I, I expect to hear that any day, don't you? Uh, I'm surprised that, you haven't already said it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's the way that, that people have always phrased things. It's, it's always, I mean, I, I read something the other day where President Obama was trying to blame what happened in Baltimore on the Republicans, why they won't enact any of his agenda. Well, how is that going to help Baltimore? In fact, if Baltimore were to enact any of the Republicans' agenda, it would probably help Baltimore. I mean, why wouldn't free market principles help Baltimore? Why wouldn't limited government help Baltimore? Baltimore has been under Democrat, as you alluded to, Baltimore has been under Democrat rule for how many generations? In fact, it was only this last election cycle that they finally gotten a Republican governor in the state. So I don't understand, as you said, how this can be anyone's fault other than the Democrats. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, it, you know, I, it, it, is, it is beyond me. How, well, I do know. I think it has to do a lot with, you know, Democrats, liberals cannot take responsibility for their own actions. And they're making yeah. excuses uh, for their constituency and for themselves. I mean, the mayor, she actually said, now, now let's be, I'm, I'm trying to be fair with her. Now, she actually said that she's giving them room to destroy uh, when, yeah. when the riots first started. Now, granted, maybe she was nervous 
and maybe that it, she, that is that's like not not exactly what she meant. But to go on on the air the next day, and and to clarify what she said instead of saying, you know what, I misspoke. That is not what I meant to say. What I meant was this. She went on on to say, I didn't say that. And, and there's right. the tape. I mean, do should why why aren't black people why aren't African Americans why aren't they down there demanding seeing this kind of hypocrisy why aren't they demanding some change from their own leadership I, I, I'm I'm at a loss because when you look at somebody who says who says one thing and they're on tape and it's all over the place one day and then she then she says something totally different I didn't say that she lies about it blatantly and they still accept her I, I don't understand that. Well, we're not really good at doing that, though, right? I mean, because if you look at what, and my daughter, who is now 13, is very upset about this, you know, because she listens to my radio show a lot. She hears what I, she hears when I go on my rants because I'm not very quiet about it. She hears me, you know, when I'm screaming at the top of my lungs going on a rant, and she asks me about it later, Mom, what did you mean by this? And, you know, we talk about um, affirmative action. And I tell her, you know, I told her about the case where the the police officers uh, where they they where they sued because they had to take a test, and the black officers got a dummy down version of the test, and she was outraged by this because she thought, what? They don't think we're smart enough to take the same test as the other officers, and she was outraged by that. And so there's this sense of entitlement that. You know, we have to take a, a, a dumbed down version of something. Um, and so it's, I think it's that kind of mentality where, you know, uh, someone gets a pass for something. And so, you know, it, it's that sort of mentality. And so you get a pass for that. I, I don't know. I, there's just something about that. So to have to go back and eat your words. It's almost like that. I always say it's like that skit with Eddie Murphy, you know, where he uh, dressed up as the white guy and he goes around and sees what, what it's like being white and he gets the newspaper and like, go ahead, take it, take it. What are you doing? Put your money on the counter. Go ahead, take it. You know, you get the, you, you, you get this pass for everything now. Um, and it just seems like that's what it is, that there's a different standard for people when you're black and there's a different standard when you're white. And so you just don't have to do anything. And so everything it's like the swoosh effect when you op- when you stand in front of the door the doors at Safeway. It's like whoosh, everything you know, it, everything just wipes away. It's whoosh. I don't know. It it, it, it just it goes away. Yeah, it it just sort of gets it, it's it's a change. It's uh, the change in mentality. Well, it, it, for instance, when it comes to education, you alluded to this that that there's a different standard uh, simply because well, simply because there's a. A, there's a different standard that the government would like to see put in place for employment once you know African Americans become adults, and that's simply because uh, during their time as in public school, there's a difference. I mean, and and we've noticed that. And, and again, these are things that people can easily find out. You know, these are government stats. But you know, Baltimore and Maryland spends. You know, they're in the top five as far as spending goes per pupil on an annual basis. Uh, Washington, D.C. is the highest in the nation, and it's the worst school district in the nation. And Baltimore is in the top five as far as spending goes. And I thought I saw something where it was like $9,000 per year per student. But they're testing at the bottom in this country. And we're, as a country, we're testing at the bottom in the world. So, uh, and who's got hold of the, of the educational system, especially in our major cities, is Democrats and their Democratic Union buddies. So I don't... Yeah. I, I don't see where where there's been any change, and I'm not, maybe you can help me out. I don't know what they're looking to change in Baltimore. I, I don't know. They're not being very clear about it. They just say, you know, cop brutality. Okay, so you get, all, you get nothing but black cops in there. You, 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 uh, you get all these police that are now beholden to the federal government. Now what? What's that going to stop? There's still going to be crime. Well, you know, you talk about the, the teachers unions and, or you talk about they, they have all this money that's dumped on per student, but you have to look at where is that money going? It goes to the teachers unions, right? Where does the money go when you talk about the, the 
cops that are going to, the, the bureaucracy, you know, it's kind of like the Clinton Foundation. You have to look, they always say, follow the money. Where does the money go? Well, 8% of it was spent on program and 92% of it that, went to, to administration. Spot, I'm coming up to so a you have to break. follow can, the money. Can you, can you hold on after the break, Marie? Sure. Okay. We're going up, coming up against the hard break folks. We'll be right back. Zinc Media. Feel the power of knowledge. Daenerys Targaryen. She's Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. Call InventHelp today. To get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-352-1609. That's 1-800-352-1609. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino, and how to get the money you need when you need it, simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 52security.com. That's the number 52security.com. 52security.com. Go to 52security.com. Hurt or injured in a car accident? It can be hard to take the proper legal action after a car accident, but waiting can cost you more. The law requires car accident victims to assert claims promptly. You could lose out by simply waiting. Call 800-709-4667 right now to see what your claim could be worth when handled by a skilled attorney. With a lawyer fighting and speaking up for you, you could be entitled to a big cash award. Call 800-709-4667. That's 800-709-4667. Now it's fast and easy to connect with the legal help you need after your car accident. Call 800-709-4667. The call is free, but you need to act now before time runs out on your claim. You need a lawyer to fight for you, protect you, and get you the compensation you need and deserve. Time's wasting. Call 800-709-4667. That's 800-709-4667. Call now. I considered suicide so I wouldn't put my family through all the pain. Many of our warriors are returning home from the battlefield only to face a new war as they struggle with devastated injuries. At Wounded Warrior Project, we understand. We're there to help. Even though you think you're broken, you're not. It's the physical and the emotional healing that Wounded Warrior Project provides. With a gift of just $19 a month, you can join Wounded Warrior Project. You'll help provide critically needed programs and services that rebuild lives. Beautiful! The ongoing needs of our wounded and their families will continue for many years to come. Now is the time to show your support. Call now or go online with your gift of just $19 a month and we'll send you this Wounded Warrior Project blanket. It made me feel that there's people out there that care about us. After this event, we can finally maybe start to heal as a family and move forward. We need your help. The families are hurting. For many of our wounded heroes, the greatest casualty is being forgotten. That's why your gift of just $19 a month is so important. Please call or go online right now. 
You shouldn't have to pay to talk to the people closest to you, or the people who used to be. That's why Umbrella Wireless is proud to announce the new friends, family, and recent ex-girlfriend plan. Now you'll get unlimited calls to your best buddy, your mom, or Cindy, once she realizes that you're seriously meant for each other and should stop screening your calls. Now the 30 minutes of agonizing silence where you're both afraid to hang up may drain your battery, but it won't drain your wallet. And you'll get unlimited calls just to check if she still cares enough to pick up with no extra charges. With a friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan, your phone will automatically answer calls from your ex because maybe she finally realizes that you're the only one for her and wants to get coffee sometime. Now, after lonely nights of looking at pictures of the road trip you took together when everything was great, your misspelled texts are absolutely free. The only thing you have to pay for is the booze. The friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan. Because she wants you back, she just doesn't know it yet. broadcast from my Bunker Eyes home studio. We're here speaking with uh, Marie Strouder from uh, African American Conservatives, uh, Conservatives Radio Show over on BTR. And before the break, we were discussing a little, uh, a little small little thing, you know, just just very small thing about about education in the uh, in the black community and and why we're not really blaming those who are really in charge of it for the poor outcome and, and why there's a, this lower expectation for us. Um, sorry for the hard break to interrupt your thought, but please continue. Well, just that I was saying that when you look at the Clinton Foundation, 8% is going to program and 92% is going to the administration. And I think, you know, when you look at the D.C. voucher program, how it was pulled by the uh, Obama administration, we talk about these teachers unions, how they are negotiating uh, for better benefits and all of these things. But the kids are the ones that are really hurt by these shenanigans. And so while they're bartering for better benefits and better wages and all of these kinds of things, are these the per spending per pupil, is it really going for the kids or is it going for the bloated salaries that these teachers are getting? You look at the pensions that some of these teachers are drawing for years and years and years after they leave, and we have these deplorable statistics. So I don't know that it's really going towards the education of our children, or is it going towards getting these, these pensions for these underperforming schools? Yeah, it seems like it, it's heading for the, 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 the pocketbooks of the wonderful union members, uh, as it were. And, and that's that's pretty sad. Look, we, we have to understand, there are some good teachers out there. There are a lot of good teachers out there. Uh, and unfortunately, that well, one of the things that we're finding out is, is that their teachers are now starting to focus on teaching towards these no child left behind standardized tests instead of actually teaching critical thinking they're teaching rote memorization on this stuff and that's having a detrimental fact uh, effect on all students across all ethnic backgrounds it doesn't really matter if you're black white asian native american mexican what have you they're all suffering equally in public schools um but you know well you're a mom of two uh, so three Three. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. The, the three kids. Wow. Brave woman. Now, now, see, I always said that you're already outnumbered with two and that anybody who has more than two is just <laughs> totally crazy. Uh, <laughs> and if anybody's ever gone through having little kids before, you know exactly what I'm talking about because they're fast. <laughs> they are really fast. But and most of the time, you know, it's it's a one on two situation, but a scenario, you know, it's a, it's a dad and the two kids or a mom and the two kids. And um You know, when you go out somewhere and they're just, you know, all over the place. So that's why I say you're outnumbered when you already have two. But you had three. Brave woman. Um, But so your kids, 
you can look at them and and see that there are certain things that you realize that they really need to know and understand. And and you're probably teaching them, as, as most parents try to do in their early stages before they go off to these public indoctrination centers, you try to teach them right from wrong. You try to teach them critical thinking skills. But then when they get into these public indoctrination centers that we call public schools, uh, you probably saw the recent video uh, where there's a young man, a high school student, and he starts wailing on a female high school student. Yes. And, and there's nobody there to, there's no adult that's willing to step in and stop them because they've taken the discipline out of schools. And if that teacher stepped in, he'd probably one be called a racist because the teacher was white and the students were black. And he'd probably end up getting fired and then sued because he put his hands on another student. It took, and this is something I have not seen anybody comment on. It took another black student who was in a, a, a military fatigue. Now, I'm going to guess that he was probably ROTC, which is why he was dressed the way he was dressed. But it took a student like that to break up this fight. Because all the teacher could do, well, the teacher was big. Looking at the two, it looked like the teacher was bigger. Um, but all the teacher could do was yell at the kids to stop fighting. And the reason why he's not stepping in is, one, because he's got this 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 pension that he wants to, you know, he's probably been teaching for 15 years. He looked like he was an older guy, 15, maybe close to 20 years. And he's getting close to his pension that he can retire and leave the whole crap behind. So are, is it serving us anything, uh, serving us, our students uh, by being able to have this sort of tenure and, and very large pension that, that, uh, well, Scott Walker sort of broke that in Wisconsin. I wish we could do that nationally, but, um, I, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where it is that we need to step in and say enough is enough because is it really the student's fault that they don't know any better yet because nobody's teaching them? Or is it really coming down to that the, the teacher's union, the SEIU, they're not in it anymore for teaching. It's another industry. It's another business. I call it big education because they say big oil and big banking. Well, this is big education. Uh, is 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 that the acceptable big business on the liberal side? Well, I saw the video that you're talking about, and uh, I'm about to. Uh, you were a little uh, blown away by the fact that I have three kids, not two. So, I hope you're sitting down for the big. I'm going in for the big punch now. Uh, not only do I have three children, but I homeschool all three. So I really have some issues. <laughs> with school. I homeschool all three of my children and I am generally the only, we're usually the only black family that, that we see. Um, my kids are, my oldest son is actually dual enrolled right now. He is 16 and he is in his second semester at college. So he gets credit for high school as well as college. Uh, my daughter is in eighth grade, but she reads at a college level. And my youngest son is in sixth grade. So I homeschool all three of them. Uh, my oldest son has been in robotics since he was in first grade. Uh, so we do a lot of really interesting things, uh, things that I don't hear most kids involved with. They're very heavily into, my daughter is into programming. Both of my older kids are into programming, very heavy into computer programming. Um, all three, in fact, they go to uh, robotics tonight for 4-H. So uh, we do a lot of really interesting things. So I have a big, big bias when it comes to education. And I think that this is one area where conservatives need to do a lot more when it comes to school choice, because I have seen firsthand in my own life, my husband and I are very, very hands-on with our kids. We are very, very involved in their education. We are very pro school choice and we have reaped the benefits of this. And our kids are doing some amazing things that most kids are not doing. The church that we attend, we have a guy that goes to, that works at Google, another guy that works at Apple. And my oldest son, who, as I said, is 16, is just about to come on his, come upon his first anniversary as an intern for an educational software company. And they have told him that 
he is far ahead of most of the interns that usually start in their second year of college with their companies because he has actual real world experience, which is something that even though they get resumes from all over the world of people that want to work at their companies, he, as a high school junior, has something that most people don't have, and that's actual, practical, hands-on, real-world experience. Because he's now, in school. Most, yeah. Yeah, that, that's... Uh, this is the, the whole notion that, that people should be able to send their kids to a school that, of their choice. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, about voucher programs, and that we know that President Obama actually sends his children to private schools, yet and still, yes. they got rid of the voucher program that was working very well in very Washington, well. D.C., yeah. And uh, they decided, well, we can't have this, so we're just going to stop it, I guess, and and force the kids back into public schools, which doesn't seem to be fair. And, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, liberals always talk about fairness. Doesn't, it doesn't seem to be fair at all. Um, and it's congratulations to your son and, and all you. your kids. They're, they're going to they're already far ahead of the game. Um, because we do know that places like, you know, in big education, uh, in, in the secondary system, uh, we also call those colleges and universities, that Harvard does have a program that seeks out homeschooled kids. Be- and their reason yeah. is because they're, they're more well-disciplined, more well-rounded, and better yeah. educated than their public school counterparts. Um, now, one of the things I, I notice about you is that you have varied interest. And one of those I interests do. that you talk about <laughs> is, um, is, and I'm going to quote you, you're the founding mama of your local knitting guild. Now, I didn't know people yes. still knitted. Yes, it's a very hip thing now. Uh, post 9-11, a lot of people got into knitting again as a way of showing, uh, you know, a lot of people did it during uh, wartime, you know. Uh, a lot of women did it. Uh, during World War II and World War I, uh, the men needed helmet liners and socks. Uh, during the Civil War, all, all of our wars in this country, Civil War, Revolutionary War, World War I, World War II, a lot of people knitted socks, bandages, those kinds of things. So after 9-11, there was a resurgence. People wanted a way to do something. So they made blankets and all of those kinds of things. Uh, Project Linus is a way that uh, is a a charity that people will make blankets for kids that are in uh, trauma. So after any kind of a disaster, these ladies will send blankets to uh, children who've been in a traumatic event. So after Katrina, they sent a lot of blankets. Anytime there's a school shooting, they'll send a blanket. So anything like that. So after after 9-11, there was a big resurgence of that. So I worked at a high-end knitting shop, and so I got, well, actually, it started when my oldest, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at age uh, 2. Type 1 is an autoimmune illness. It was formerly known as juvenile diabetes, so it's very different than type 2. I always make that distinction. Um, And so I started knitting again as a way to kind of process that and uh, deal with that. And uh, so I started knitting again. I learned as a child. And so I just started knitting again. And uh, so then I started working at this high-end knitting shop. And so I founded a guild. And I actually am a small business owner. And so my business is uh, teaching people how to knit. And I do it for the homeschool community. And so I'm just a big knitter. And all my kids knit. All three of my children know how to knit, the boys and my daughter. My oldest son taught my husband how to knit for one of his charitable projects. When I was in the process of adopting my two youngest children, my oldest son is our child biologically. My two youngest children were adopted. So while they were in foster care, we were waiting for the adoption to be finalized. My oldest son uh, got involved in a project through uh, a charitable organization. He did a, it's called the Red Scarf Project. So children who are transitioning out of the foster care system and go to college, they don't have a family to support them and uh, cheer them on as they're in college. So there's an organization that sends them care packages. 
And so wow. in this care package is a, a scarf and they send them at Valentine's Day. So that's why it's the Red Scarf Project. And so my son, who was eight at the time, uh, rallied people around him to knit a red scarf for this project. So he taught his dad how to knit and he got 172 scarves. Wow. And so, yeah. Good cool. for him. Congratulations. That, now, see, th this is what you can do, folks, when you, when you actually homeschool your kids and your kids are not suffering at all. Now, as I introduced you earlier, that you're the host of the African-American Conservatives radio show over in BTR. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, Marie, about how people can listen to you and where they can find more information about you and even possibly contact you? Hello, Marie? Did we lose her? I think we did lose her. Uh, well, that is terrible. Uh, I wanted to. Well, first of all, you can find her over on Blog Talk Radio Network. Um, she is the host of the African uh, African American Conservatives Radio Show over on BTR, also known as Acon. That's A A C O N S. Uh, you can actually. Um, uh, look her up, too, uh, on about.me, Marie Strouder. Uh, I'll have information about her on my webpage. I think maybe we'll get her back here in just a second. Marie? Hello, Marie? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you now. There you go. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just asking you before we lost. You know, technology, of course, ha happens to me all the time. Gotta I'm love sorry. It. It's, it's my, my curse here. I'm a uh, permanent war against technology. Uh, but I was trying to tell people how they could possibly listen to you. Could you tell us how they could you know, listen to you and uh, get in touch with you if they wanted to, especially with the, uh, the Knitting Guild and other things like that and um, the Acons program over on BTR? Well, you can find us every Tuesday night. We're on Blog Talk Radio. And that's blogtalkradio.com forward slash A-A-C-O-N-S. Uh, you can find our website at africanamericanconservatives.com. We're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash A-A-C-O-N-S. And we're on Twitter at A-A-C-O-N-S. And uh, for my knitting guild, I guess you can find me any of those places and ask me about it um, at Twitter, you can find me at Marie Strauder, uh, M-A-R-I-E-S-T-R-O-U-G-H-T-E-R. -E and uh, I, I have a fan page on Facebook as well. So uh, if you see me posting on our Acons page, there's a link to me and my fan page there. So you can ask me about knitting or homeschooling or politics or just about anything else, 70s rock music, or I don't care. And I'll, I'll tell you anything you'd like to know. <laughs> 70s rock music. There we go. <laughs> well, Marie, it has been a pleasure having you on the program tonight. We definitely must get together again real soon. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day, Mom of Three, and uh, being here with me. Thanks so much for having me, and I thank your audience for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. That was Marie Strouder from African American Conservatives Radio over on BTR, plus of uh, a bunch of other things. She's a busy woman, very busy woman. Um, and she's got some well-rounded kids, uh, which, you know, you get to do when you, when you homeschool. Now, she is by far not the only person to homeschool there there are a lot it is a growing uh, i hate to use the word industry but it is a growing industry in this country uh and it isn't i know a lot of people that don't fully understand homeschooling they they, they want to say well uh homeschooling is only for you know the radicals the you know these radical christian conservative uh, you know ultra conservative god and country type of people Actually, no, that's not true. Yes, th those types do tend to homeschool as well, but homeschooling runs the gamut. You even got liberal parents, you know, unfortunately, out there who are homeschooling because they fully understand. This is why I say, you know what? I don't know why anybody still sends their kids to these public indoctrination centers that we call public schools.
I don't understand it. When there are so many alternatives and people, you know, they, they, they usually come back to me and says, well, well, Ron, everybody can't afford a private school. And I, one of the things that I always notice now, if you're, if you're a single parent household and you're, you're not in, you know, the upper middle class, I can understand that argument because, you know, you're a single parent, you got to work in order to, prov- to provide, understood that. But a lot of times when I hear these people talk about it and say that they can't afford public schools, I kind of chastise them because I look at, I look at their driveway, what's in their driveway and what's parked in their driveway is usually two newer cars. A lot of times, at least one of them is what we would call a luxury car or a luxury plate, like an Infiniti or a Beamer or a Mercedes or an Audi. Now, you got to understand that those kinds of cars, they have a monthly price tag of $500 or more. Now, I'm sorry, but you know, if you're, if you're sitting on paying on a car note, 500 bucks a month, that will more than pay for the tuition at many private schools uh, at the elementary and middle school level. It, it, it will more than cover it. Uh, and not to mention a lot of these same people, they're living in, they're, they're what we call house poor or mortgage poor. And what does that mean? Because they have, they have bought into this notion that, you know, you should max out, you should buy the biggest house that you can afford to buy and, you know, and max out your monthly payment at 30 or th- 30 to 32% of your in- uh, monthly income. No, that's a bunch of BS. And you have these people that are out there with 2,500 square foot, 3,000 square foot houses with two, two and a half car garages with, you know, two full baths and, and a half bath. And they've got to have the, you know, the media center and media, you know, they're spending 300 grand or more on a house, the size that they really don't need. Because let's face it, your parents uh, you know, they lived in a house small. They, you were probably raised in a house that was a lot smaller than that. Uh, you know, I, I know my parents' house was about 15, 1,600 square feet. So it isn't that you need this huge, and we had plenty of space. We weren't on top of each other. But we had, pl- and, and, and we had plenty of space to be together as a family and to be off on our own to get some private time when we wanted to be private and off on our own. So we weren't crowded, you know, and my dad always tended to, he tended to buy cars very infrequently. He would drive them until it made no sense to repair them anymore. And I kind of taken that, I've gotten that kind of notion for my, for my father on that one. I don't buy a new car every two or three years. But we have all these extraneous payments. And then if we, if we just took a look at our budget and decided, well, you know what? My kid's education is a little bit more important than that Infiniti or BMW in the driveway. So maybe I'll settle for, I don't know, driving a Chevy or a Toyota instead. And paying for my kid's education. There are ways to do it. Now, yes, I would prefer that there be a voucher program or voucher system where people can decide in a little bit of competition uh, in where you can, you know, within a school district, you can pick and choose where you want to send your kid to school. I think those are great ideas and that we should be, we should get to that point. But until then, you, the parent are responsible for your child's education, nobody else. And that you need to take this into consideration. I know we're coming to the end of this, this school year now, but you need to find it, figure out and find out how not to send your children back to a failing public indoctrination center come September. Because you're hurting your kid. You know, the kid growing up in that 3,000 square foot, that's not, as, that's not important to them. Being able to get a good education, starting. Now, I, they don't even have to go to college. Because, you know, maybe your son or daughter, maybe they'll end up being a blue collar person or start their own business or what have you. They don't need to go to college for, for that kind of stuff. But that base education is so important because they will use that for their entire life. And they will also use that when they're being pitched to by these wonderful pitchmen that we call politicians every two and four years. They won't be so easily swayed. Oh, look, I, I, I know quite a few people who homeschool their kids and that is a beautiful thing. Now that, that shows parents who do care and who are putting their time and money where their mouth is because they fully understand that if they can't get, if they can't afford to send their kid to, to a private institution, 
even, you know, uh, God forbid you send your kid to a Catholic par- uh, or parochial school. Uh, you know, that, that's religious, Rod. You can't do that. And those are fairly inexpensive, by the way. Um, but, it, I, you know, they spend less money. Uh, these private and parochial schools spend less money per year, per student, than the public schools do. And yet, these private school kids and, and, uh, um, and, and Catholic school kids, they outscore and are better educated than those kids who go to these schools that spend nine thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars or more per student per year. So but don't don't no don't don't try to tell me that that you can't get a good education by homeschooling. Because like I said, Harvard is looking for homeschoolers. They like them. They prefer them for obvious reasons. We'll be right back. Daenerys Targaryen. She says she is the mother of dragons. But would you trust her with your kids? Her father was a maniac. She palled around with Dothraki terrorists. She asked the city of Karth for a government bailout. Then she lost three baby dragons after placing them in an unlocked wooden box. An unlocked wooden box. This Khaleesi wants to be queen of the Seven Kingdoms, but can she be trusted? Daenerys Targaryen. Wrong for dragons. Wrong for the realm. Paid for by the committee to protect dragons. We don't know anything about him. He was never really vetted. Is he really the true-born son of Robert Baratheon? All over the Seven Kingdoms, people are asking the same question. Who is the real King Joffrey? The people of Westeros are hurting. Winter is coming. Crop yields are falling. And the price of fuel is going up. The cost of peat moss is through the thatched roof. And this young and inexperienced king takes advice from a whoremongering imp and has launched an illegal war in the north. What is King Joffrey hiding? This is not our kind of family values. King Joffrey, what a bastard. What a bastard. Paid for by the Emberathians for freedom. Rob Stark, he's the biggest celebrity in the North. But his father was a traitor. He arrested his own mother. His bastard brother deserted the Night's Watch. And he couldn't defend his own castle. Worst of all, Rob Stark hasn't stopped the wildlings from invading our lands and taking our jobs. He even has an illegal alien for a nanny. And now he wants to be king in the North? King? Some people say he's really a wolf. Some people say he eats dead people. We can't wait until it's too late. Send a raven to Winterfell now and tell Rob Stark to go back home. Stop eating dead people and defend the damn wall. This ad paid for by Crossbows GPS. You shouldn't have to pay to talk to the people closest to you, or the people who used to be. That's why Umbrella Wireless is proud to announce the new friends, family, and recent ex-girlfriend plan. Now you'll get unlimited calls to your best buddy, your mom, or Cindy, once she realizes that you're seriously meant for each other and should stop screening your calls. Now the 30 minutes of agonizing silence where you're both afraid to hang up may drain your battery, but it won't drain your wallet. And you'll get unlimited calls just to check if she still cares enough to pick up with no extra charges. With a friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan, your phone will automatically answer calls from your ex because maybe she finally realizes that you're the only one for her and wants to get coffee sometime. Now, after lonely nights of looking at pictures of the road trip you took together when everything was great, your misspelled texts are absolutely free. The only thing you have to pay for is the booze. The friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan. Because she wants you back, she just doesn't know it yet. When you can't find anything to watch on cable, you get bored. When you get bored, you listen to radio cooking shows. When you listen to radio cooking shows, you invite a friend over for dinner. When you invite a friend over for dinner, you use twice as many beans. 
When you use twice as many beans, you expel deadly farts that kill your friend's dog. When you kill your friend's dog, your friend becomes unstable. When your friend becomes unstable, you're sued for everything you're worth. When you're sued for everything you're worth, you're thrown to the streets. When you're thrown to the streets, you devote your life to world domination. When you devote your life to world domination, you become an evil fascist overlord. When you become an evil fascist overlord, old friends plot their revenge. When old friends plot their revenge, you are shot in the back of the head. And when you're shot in the back of the head, you miss your jazzercise appointment. Don't miss your jazzercise appointment. Upgrade to Indirect TV. Go online or call 1 800 Direct TV. Millions of Americans every day are shedding unwanted pounds by taking tested and proven ultra lipo stick. Carbohydrates are bad, bad. Our carbo fighting antioxidant is good, good. Just listen to these satisfied customers. My name is Gal, and I lost like 20 pounds on ultra lipo stick. My name is Jared, and I lost 46 pounds using ultra lipo stick. My name is Zach, and I actually gained weight. This stuff sucks. Ultra lipo stick is safe and easy to inject just three doses four times a day discreetly underneath your fingernail listen to this i used ultra lipo stick and suffered from side effects like uncontrollable greasy discharge ultra lipo stick it turned the armpits of all of my shirts orange this stuff is crap try it today and see some real results ultra lipo stick not available in stores results may vary Mentioning homeschooling versus uh, sending your kid to a private school versus having the Beamer. Don't you know how hard I work to pay? I I deserve that BMW or that Mercedes. Um, you know what? People have to understand. And your kids are only with you for a very short period of time. And if you think 18 years is a long time. And if you have two or three kids, you know, that, that may, may be a total for all three to, to get up to the age of 18 and into college and out of the house. That might be you know, a total of 20, 25 years. Yeah, that, that is quite a bit of time, but that leaves you with a lot of time left over. Um, you know, to, to, to do what you want to do, because you're supposed to look, those your kids didn't ask to be bring, brought into the world. Sorry, they didn't. So it is your responsibility to do everything that you possibly can during their formative years of, of birth to 18 to give them the best possible foundation so they can go out there and make a good life uh, and, and you know make you proud and, and, and themselves proud and so they can have a happy life. So they're not stuck in some dead-end job someplace that they absolutely hate and be miserable and have a terrible home life when you know, they have kids. and uh, You don't want that cycle to continue. That's all I'm saying. Good. Hello, uh, my fellow Americans. It is I, your lovable host, Elrod, coming to you live from my Bunker Eyes home studio somewhere within the great granite state of New Hampshire, where the state motto is still live free or die. It is not big government or bust. We are marching right along, sliding into the weekend. It is Thursday, Thursday, May the 7th. 
in the year of our Lord, 2015. And the number that you can call this evening, should you wish to give me a buzz and uh, talk to me live on the air, is uh, 603-835-3224. That's 603-835-3224. And if I see you, I will put you on uh, on the show here with me. And uh, I noticed that during the break that there were a couple of calls that came through. So if you were out there and you're listening now and you actually called the show during the break, well, obviously there's not much I can do uh, during the break. You're not going to be able to get on the air. Uh, But give us a call back. We will uh, pick you right up and put you back on the air. You probably wanted to chastise me on the homeschooling stuff. <laughs> that's probably going to get some raise some people's ire, but that that's okay. That's, you know, that's that's what I do. It's what we do. It's what I do. Yeah, it's it's what we do over here. We make people upset all the time. Here's something that that might not make you so upset. And this is from USA Today, believe it or not, but uh, appeals court Strike strikes down government's phone surveillance program. That's right. A federal appellate court ruled Thursday the NSA overstepped its boundaries in its practice of collecting America's phone metadata. Now, a federal appeals court uh, declared earlier today uh, that a national that the National Security Agency program that sweeps up lots of America's phone calls is illegal. Uh, representing the most significant setback yet for the long-running surveillance program that the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York said the program exceeds the scope of what Congress had authorized under the USA Patriot Act, which the government has maintained, uh, maintained permitted the massive data collection. Look, our, our, our government has, has built not one, but a few uh, massive data collection and storage centers in different parts of the country. Um, and uh, so, some of those places we don't, we don't even know about. And it, it has come to my attention that, that there has, you know, we have, we have uh, our government has refurbished some old Cold War bunker types of facilities. And that what they're doing with some of those facilities is, you know, preparing one putting those those data collection services there so in case there's an EMP from you know outer space or from a, 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 a nuclear attack that stuff won't get wiped out that's why they're doing this uh, look look if our government is planning for such an EMP EMP type of disaster be it from natural sources or man-made sources uh, doesn't that kind of tell you that, you know, really it's more likely going to come from a man-made source and that, that our, our government knows something that they're not telling us and that they're preparing for? Just saying. Just, you know, just the saying. But in, in this particular case, now the statutes to which the government points have never been interpreted to authorize anything approaching the breadth of the sweeping surveillance at issue here, said Judge Gerald Lynch. Uh, He wrote the opinion for the three-judge panel. And hooray! But but before you start celebrating the streets, you need to know that uh, the judge, um, uh, basically the the, the panel is saying, well, you know, we're not going to tell you that you have, even though they said this is illegal, uh, you don't have to, like, cut it right now. So the NSA is still capable, uh, trust, not that the NSA would probably stop if a court says for them to stop. But, uh, look, w- once you get government programs operating, somebody's going to think of some way to get, a, to get around the system and, and still slightly be with just enough inside legality that uh, nobody's going to end up going to jail over it if they're ever caught. It's, it, it will be a PR nightmare for for an administration if they were to be caught doing such a thing, but it would, it wouldn't, they would find the a legal loophole somewhere. And that would allow them to keep doing what they're doing. And the judge kind of provides them with a temporary legal 
loophole right now saying, well, you know, the Congress needs to go back and fix this. So in other words, what the judge was, what the, 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 um, the appellate court was basically saying that under current law, current statute, this is illegal. And what Congress needs to do now, instead of ending the practice and program, what Congress needs to do is just go write another law that makes us legal. That's basically what the appellate court told the NSA and Congress. Hey, Congress, just write a law, pass it, that makes this illegal. Or it makes this legal. So now it doesn't ever have to come back here again. Because you will have made it, you know, completely legal by law. That's, you know, that's the problem. See, judges are not supposed to do, they're not supposed to suggest law. They're not supposed to write law. They're only supposed to interpret the law. And is that law constitutional? Is it legal? Is it just? That's their job. Their job is not to deter, well, you know, this is illegal, but we're going to stay. We're going to keep letting you do this illegal activity, giving Congress time to make it legal. And that's what the court is suggesting. That's not the court's job. They're not supposed to, you know, make things easier for the government to trample on our rights. But that's exactly what the... Now, people look at this and say that that it's a win for the American people and our rights. But no, it's not because of how they did it. They're not stopping the practice. No way. They're not stopping the practice right now. And they're not telling, you know, the NSA, well, you know, you got to cut that out right now. Here's an injunction. You got to stop. Cut it. You know, cut the cables. Can't do it. Anymore. No, that's not what they said. They said this is illegal and Congress needs to make it legal. That's what they said. So, no, But, you know, Congress is debating the, the whole Patriot Act issue right now. And you, as a voter, as an American citizen had better get on the horn with your representative and your, and your uh, senator and tell them they better not vote for an extension of this type of uh, intrusive government s- surveillance program. It doesn't make us safer. Now, what it was fully intended was to, to intercept foreign uh, communications. You know, things that are offshore. Uh, and and if if they're if they're saying that they need to be able to collect this data onshore, then then they, that means that they know that there are people in this country who should not be here, and that they, they should be closing the borders down to prevent even more people from coming over here that should not be here. It's, you have to look at this as in a big picture sort of uh, sense and understand that the government is admitting that they are not protecting us. And this is why some people are saying, well, you know, I'd rather be secure and safe than sorry. Well, the problem is, is that since you're allowing this type of thing, the government feels that they do not need to do their constitutional duty and really protect you and our borders. They'll just pick up the information later. Instead of stopping them from even getting here and finding out who's here that should not be here and getting rid of them. No, 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 no. They're just going to say, you know what? We just, well, we just do this, this really lazy man's way of, of collecting all this data, metadata. And hey, look, if they don't know who you are when they're collecting it, then how do they find out? Don't for an instant fall for this notion that it's only metadata. They don't, they don't know who you are. Each individual call is, oh, that's a bunch of bunk. Because otherwise, what good is it? They need to be able to know who it is that is raising a red flag. And they need to know their location. So that's the whole point. So this whole notion that they, it's metadata, we don't know, that's a bunch of bunk. Because they do know. They do know. And you have to ask, well, where does that stop? And where is that going to lead in the future? What, what, what else? I mean, what other type of liberty or freedom are, are we going to be, is, is going to be swept aside or swept under 
in order to to placate people's uh, feelings of fear. Do we really want to be placated by fear, or do we want to be placated by uh, real security, which is closing the borders, catching the bad guy, catching all the bad guys that are here, and getting rid of them? Oh, Ron, you know, we've got these homegrown terrorists. Well, we got homegrown terrorists because we're letting in the wrong element who's establishing camps here in the forms of, you know, radical churches and in mosque. That's why we've got homegrown terrorist. Look, you, you can't be a homegrown terrorist unless somebody teaches you, indoctrinates you. Well, if we don't let those kind of people into this country that can then turn to our young people and teach them the wrong things and indoctrinate them in the first place, then we, then we wouldn't have to work. No, yeah, I kind of advocate a 1950s mentality. I'm not, I'm not saying that we run around and start, you know, doing the uh, McCarthy uh, type of stuff, you know, you know, pinko communists. Are you a pinko communist? Uh, I, don't, I don't mean that you start running around and saying, are you a red Islamist? No, we don't need to do that because that, that was horrible. What happened to real law abiding American loving people uh, that got caught up in, in McCarthyism back then. But it, it is an example of being able to watch those who come here and being able to determine if they're American enough. Look, as a, as a, as a nation, we have a right to decide who gets to come here and who gets to stay. If you're not a citizen, we get to tell people who are not citizens who gets to come here, how long they get to stay, if they get to stay, period. Period. Every nation has that right. You know, you, me as a foreigner to say, you know, Iran, I, I have no rights to go to Iran, you know, to go to Iran. I have no right to once I get to Iran to, to, to start dictating and demanding that they that the Iranian government follow me and my lead and, and do what I want them to. Hell no. I'm not an Iranian citizen. I, as far as that type of stuff is, other than just basic human rights, I have no rights in Iran. And, quite frankly, Iranians, when they come here, other than basic human rights, they have no rights here. Fully understand that. You get to, the country that is the host gets to dictate certain things. And if they say, well, you know, hey, if you're going to come here, then, you know, these types of things are out of, off limits or out of bounds for you, then that's the way it is. As long as it's not, I mean, we obviously we can't say, deny a basic human, human right of dignity and say, well, you know, you can't, can't go to a ball game. No, can't do that. Uh, you, you know, uh, you, you, can't, you can't attend church services here. Well, as long as the church is not radicalizing anybody, it's not, it's not a terror cell, uh, then no, we can't prevent people from going to a church. But you can prevent them from staying here and saying, you know what, you've overextended your stay, goodbye. Get out. See you later, and we have the right to say, don't come back. You're not allowed back. Just as they have the right to say it in their own country. I, I, look, I, I'm, I have no problems with that when it comes to people's own country. I'm not suggesting that well, you know, you know, we get to do whatever we want in other people. Absolutely not. We don't get to do what we want in other people's countries just as they don't get to do what they want here in our country. I, I don't know how, why that is so difficult for people to understand. Because America belongs to Americans and those who want to be Americans. It doesn't belong to anyone else. And you can come and visit that, you know, we, we, we kind of like that. That's not a big deal. Come and visit. But understand that when you're here visiting, there are certain things that you have to abide by. And you know, I, 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 it, it sounds like I'm trying to be anti-world, world whatever. I'm not. I'm being pro-national. 
I'm being a pro-nationalist for whatever country that you are from. I'm being, you know, I'm being pro-American. I'm being pro-French in France. I'm being uh, uh, pro-English in Britain. I'm being pro-Russian in Russia. I'm being pro-Chinese in China. I'm being, you know, pro-Iranian in Iran. I am not pro-Iranian in America. I am not pro-French in America. I am not pro-American in Italy. Get my meaning here? So this this whole notion that you get to go anywhere on the planet and do what do it the hell you please, that's not the case. You don't have a right to do that. Because people all over the planet, they have a right to set up the kind of government that they want and live in the the type of society that they want to live in. If you want to go there, if people want to come to the United States of America, we have a culture here. You are to blend in and meld with our culture. Now, I'm not saying that you shed everything that you are at the border. Obviously not. But you don't come here and start dictating that you want things exactly the way they were back in your home country. Because if you want that kind of stuff, you go back there. You come here, you conform to American society, American culture. Just the same as if an American were to go, I don't know, to Germany. The American is to conform to German culture and German society. Plain and simple. That means that you should probably learn German so that when you come here... You need to learn English. We shouldn't be catering to all these different people. This is how we get into trouble. We can't be catering to to the entire world. When you go to that particular country that you're going to, you have to cater to that country. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And that's the fair thing to do for all you people out there who are into being fair. It's not fair. No, it's not fair that, that... They come here and dictate that we've got to change our way of life to suit them. No, that's not fair. Because we definitely can't go to their home country and start dictating uh, that they change for us. Fairness is what fairness does. And fairness dictates that you conform to the country that you're in. And if you don't like the society and how it's set up and their culture, then you don't go to that country. If you do not like America, do not come here. If you do not like America and you do come here, then you better behave yourself. Or you should be a, you should expect that you will get a swift Uncle Sam boot to get kicked the hell out of here. Plain and simple. And I don't know why some some on the left don't think that that's not fair. It's totally fair. And don't tell me, well, you know, Rod, it's going to keep, you know, it's going to keep us all separate. No, it is not going to keep us all separate. Look, this whole notion that we need to have one world government and that we're going to become one, uh, one whole planet is a is is a Star Trek dream and farce. It's not going to happen anytime soon. I'm sorry to, to tell you, you know, to, to burst people's bubbles, but that type of thing is not going to happen anytime soon unless somebody is just going to, you know, like the book of Revelation, you're going to have the, uh, the beast that rises and he's going to, by war, force everybody into his one world government and his one world of being. Uh, who who gets to decide whose culture is superior? By the way, I, I'm, I'm that's a serious question. In order for there to be a one world government and one world culture, somebody's culture is going to have to be superior. You know, I, we've had that kind of thing with you know fascists and and communists and and dictators all over the planet throughout history. Oh, yeah, no, no, our our culture and our people are superior to the other human beings and cultures on the planet. So we're going to go to war and force everybody to live like we do. That's a bunch of BS. And for you liberals who think, who, who like to look at the world as being fair and unfair, that's not fair. 
It's not fair for somebody else to dictate that, you know, to, to decide that the way I live my life is, 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 is bad. You know, the, the culture that I like to participate in is bad. Sorry, that's, that's not the way it works anywhere on the planet. So why should we say that this is the way it should work in the good old U.S. of A.? It shouldn't work that way. It's not going to work that way. It's not, what it's gonna, what's going to happen is you're going to end up destroying the very nation that you think that you're trying to preserve. You know how you preserve your nation and your culture? By actually living it and not letting outside forces come in and dictate that you change and then forcing their changes upon you. So, they, so then you end up looking more like them instead of yourself. And that's his whole notion with Sharia law. Oh, we need Sharia law, Rod. No. Go to Iran for Sharia. In the United States, we don't have it. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. Call InventHelp today. To get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-352-1609. That's 1-800-352-1609. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino, and how to get the money you need when you need it, simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 52security.com. That's the number 52security.com. 52security.com. Go to 52security.com. Hurt or injured in a car accident? It can be hard to take the proper legal action after a car accident, but waiting can cost you more. The law requires car accident victims to assert claims promptly. You could lose out by simply waiting. Call 800-709-4667 right now to see what your claim could be worth when handled by a skilled attorney. With a lawyer fighting and speaking up for you, you could be entitled to a big cash award. Call 800-709-4667. That's 800-709-4667. Now it's fast and easy to connect with the legal help you need after your car accident. Call 800-709-4667. The call is free, but you need to act now before time runs out on your claim. You need a lawyer to fight for you, protect you, and get you the compensation you need and deserve. Time's wasting. Call 800-709-4667. That's 800-709-4667. Call now. I considered suicide so I wouldn't put my family through all the pain. Many of our warriors are returning home from the battlefield only to face a new war as they struggle with devastated injuries. At Wounded Warrior Project, we understand. We're there to help. Even though you think you're broken, you're not. It's the physical and the emotional healing that Wounded Warrior Project provides. With a gift of just $19 a month, you can join Wounded Warrior Project. You'll help provide critically needed programs and services that rebuild lives. Beautiful. The ongoing needs of our wounded and their families will continue for many years to come. Now is the time to show your support. Call now or go online with your gift of just $19 a month and we'll send you this Wounded Warrior Project blanket. It made me feel that there's people out there that care about us. After this event, we can finally maybe start to heal as a family and move forward. We need your help. The families are hurting. 
For many of our wounded heroes, the greatest casualty is being forgotten. That's why your gift of just $19 a month is so important. Please call or go online right now. You shouldn't have to pay to talk to the people closest to you or the people who used to be. That's why Umbrella Wireless is proud to announce the new friends, family, and recent ex-girlfriend plan. Now you'll get unlimited calls to your best buddy, your mom, or Cindy once she realizes that you're seriously meant for each other and should stop screening your calls. Now the 30 minutes of agonizing silence where you're both afraid to hang up may drain your battery, but it won't drain your wallet. And you'll get unlimited calls just to check if she still cares enough to pick up with no extra charges. With a friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan, your phone will automatically answer calls from your ex because maybe she finally realizes that you're the only one for her and wants to get coffee sometime. Now, after lonely nights of looking at pictures of the road trip you took together when everything was great, your misspelled texts are absolutely free. The only thing you have to pay for is the booze. The friend's family and recent ex-girlfriend plan. Because she wants you back, she just doesn't know it yet. Environment Chairman, Global Warming Alarmist. This is from CNSNews.com. Global Warming alarmis, Alarmism has evolved into a religion. Folks, I've been telling you this for years, that environmentalism and global warming is a religion. Because no matter how much how much you want to believe in something like this, you're actually believing in it in spite of the facts. It doesn't matter how many times or how much uh, it is shown and proven scientifically and anecdotally and by pure observance of the eye uh, that global man-made global warming doesn't exist. Uh, they're still out there trying to tell us that it does and that we've got to do all these drastic, expensive things to curtail people's freedom and, and um, in order to save the planet. Well, that's basically a religious thought. You know, pointing approvingly to an op-ed published in the Wall Street Journal by House Science Chairman Lamar Smith, Uh, Senate Environment Chairman Jim Inhofe of Oklahoma said that the Senate floor yesterday that global warming alarmists are advancing a new religious sect. You know, we had, uh, speaking of which, I, I, uh, I, uh, I forgot. Um, I have, I have HBO now. And one of the things that I, I wanted to take a look at, and I didn't, maybe I'll do that tonight after, after the show. Uh, is to look at the the, the Scientology documentary. Uh, and I've heard some very interesting things about it. And look, look I know some people say, now no, pay attention here, folks. This Scientology is very relevant to the conversation about environmentalism. Now, you have to understand that Scientology is... A relatively new religion and they'll say it's not a religion if you're talking if you're talking to a Scientologist but it is it's a religion it's a it's a it's a belief system and that's all religion really is it's a belief system that you live your life by or you try to live your life by now understand that you know many Christians they Christianity is a religion but people, they consider themselves to be Christians because they try, to, they try to live by the standards of the religion of Christianity. They're, they're trying to live by the tenets of that particular religion. They're not trying to live by the, te- the tenets of another uh, faith or religion. 
uh, they're trying to to live their lives by the tenets of that particular faith. It, uh, faith, and a lot of times, you know, we look at people and they and they and they fall woefully short of that. And depending on how they fall short of that, we like to call them hypocrites often, which sometimes the shoe fits. But when it gets to Scientology, it's also a religion because it has uh, religious beliefs. In other words, there are tenets that people are supposed to be following uh, in order to, to live the life of, well, one of their tenets is called, you know, going clear or being clear. And if you don't know what that is, and you, you probably should probably watch the documentary then. But understand that these people, like Tom Cruise, they try to live this philosophy of being and living clear. Well, that's a religious tenant or faith tenant of the Church of Scientology. Now, whether or not it's real or not is, is, is irrelevant because it's what, it's what people who get involved believe. And understand that this is a relatively new religion. It was founded and started by a rather contemporary, you know, an author that many people... Uh, who are alive? To, many people who are alive today were alive when L. Ron Hubbard was alive. So it's not that far removed from us. And you have to understand that L. Ron Hubbard, he was, uh, you know, he, he's a fiction, uh, a rather successful fiction writer. And part of the reason that he started Scientology, not, not the full reason, but part of the reason, uh, as legend goes, and there's some evidence to back that up, is that part of the reason was it was a dare or a bet and that L. Ron Hubbard, who was a noted atheist, said that he could start a religion and have people follow it in that it would be a big religion. And it was kind of a dare. Okay, go ahead and do it. So he comes up with this whole notion. He, he's not a psychologist, but he comes up with this whole notion of going clear and makes up all these tenets for this later to be known as Scientology. You know, science, being tolerant uh, of science and, and using science in your life, basically. And using scientific methods, and, and uh, whether they're actual real scientific methods or, or f- fake scientific methods, uh, you know, uh, false scientific methods, it, it's all about trying to make things look scientific and he believed that he could do this, and, in, and indeed, he did. In Scientology, in certain understandings of the word, is a cult. And this has the same ramifications as does the global warming crowd, because they have morphed from science, from just pure science, to conjecture, to just blatant disregard for other scientific fact that disregards their claim. So they're going by faith that what they tell us is going to happen someday. And they keep, in order to keep it as a faith and not scientific fact and proof, is that every time they, now, whenever they're making dire predictions and dire claims of what's going to happen on the planet, they start moving those claims out farther and farther. So that by the time that these claims that they're making today actually come to pass in their mind, most if not all of us alive today will be dead. So they don't know in the, you know, well, if we don't do something about it now in the year 2100, you know, all hell's going to break loose. Well, most of us are not going to be here in the year 2100. So now they're going by faith that this is actually going to happen because there is no, no scientific proof of what they said that, it, that things happen in the time frame that they said it was going to happen in the past. So they've created a new religion. So, you know, uh, they have it absolutely right. You know, Senator Inhofe and, 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 and Senator uh, Smith, they have it right. This is a new religion. Because all of this, uh, it's, it's, all right, l- let me put it to you in this way. 
It's like the book of Revelation. For, uh, for, for Christianity, it's like the book of Revelation. All the, you know, we've been talking for the past 2,000 years that Revelation was going to happen sometime in the future. When Christ comes back, you know, it was going to happen in the future. All right. It's always been beyond the lifespan of those who believed it. Now, today we have people who think, well, now it's going to happen within our lifetime, but that's beside the point. The point is, is that it became a religion because all this stuff was going to happen beyond the lifespan of those that believed it. This is where global warming enthusiasts come into play. They are now starting to make predictions and putting things out there that go beyond the lifespan of those who currently believe it. That makes it a faith, and that faith turns it into a religion. And they worship at the altar of man-made global warming. We might as well start calling it the church of global warming. I, I, I mean, it, 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 it's really, you can't say it's any other way. It really, you, you really can't. I, I hope I made that perfectly clear. Because that's all it really is right now. It is, it is a newfangled religion. And their God, uh, I don't know, their gods might, you know, well, at least their prophets are, are people like Al Gore. Um, and, their, and their God is the planet, Mother Nature, Gaia. Uh, well, I guess that would be goddess, not God. Here's something that was kind of alarming. I, I, I noticed from uh, the, it comes from the Hill via Newsmax. Uh, U.S. oil firms meet secretly in Tehran on business deals. Now, before I get into this, you have to understand that these companies cannot meet in secret with Tehran because it wouldn't really matter uh, what their secret meetings would entail and, and how they would come about if we had a strong administration that was standing strong against Iran, Tehran. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do any business with them anyway. But since we have a president who's, who's uh, you know, uh, going to Tehran with open arms, in, ante- in anticipation, anticipation of lifted sanctions, the Iran is thinking that they're going to, in order to get this nuclear deal, they're going to, you know, they're, everybody's going to fall in line with lifting sanctions against them. This is what they're hoping for. This is what... This is what they believe is going to happen. And our president has already, you know, pretty much said, yeah, well, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, 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 we, we can do that. As long as we can get a deal, we can do that. Uh, in anticipation of lifted sanctions, Iran has invited U.S. oil company heads and other investors to visit Tehran to discuss their mutual business interest. The Hill is reporting. Now, the country is interested in connecting with Western businesses as it offers massive crude oil reserves for the future. Now, the Hill noted that this is in a, uh, noted, uh, is in a shroud of secrecy. Well, obviously, it's not that big of a secret, is it, if the Hill found out about it and if Newsmax printed it? Not that big of a secret. I, I'm going to say that this was something that really wasn't meant to be totally under the radar. Because, well, now, now you're going to get the... Well, I'm surprised you're not having the left out. Now, understand, look, think about this for a second. Think about the dichotomy and in, in, in the total uh, mental anguish of your typical liberal. Now, what do liberals hate? They hate big oil. They're like big oil, they're evil, mean, you know, selfish, blah, they're terrible. Terrible oil is bad for the planet, you know, global warming, all that. This terrible oil is terrible. But when it comes to yeah, you know, we should make peace. But they're also thinking the left liberal, we should make peace with Iran. You know, uh, you know, if if we're only nice to them, they'll be nice to us, and all this terrorism would fade away, and things would be great. You know, and we should stop meddling in the Middle East and stop, stop dealing in oil and stuff in the Middle East. Oh, yeah, that, you know, we can't, you know, they, they don't, if we didn't, if we weren't, if it wasn't all about oil, you know, we wouldn't be there and we wouldn't be screwing things up over there. So now you have Iran 
inviting big oil to come over in anticipation of all these sanctions being released, what is a good liberal to do? I mean, yeah, do they not want to lift these sanctions and have Iran join the world community? But if they do that, that means all their oil reserves are now going to be free for everybody to go and, you know, and get and pollute and, 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 and global warming will continue. What do they do with that? And, and, and now how about their religion? You know, we're talking Iran and the, and the imams over there that run the country. They want money. And the way they can get money is by doing business with people around the world. And the product or service that they have that's huge that everybody on the planet needs and wants is oil. So they want to sell their oil, you know, to other companies that can then make money off of it. And who's the biggest producer right now? The the biggest countries that need or have companies that are able to turn that oil into a profit for not only those companies, but for Iran. Well, those companies would naturally come from two countries, basically, United States and China. And so they're now inviting, you know, American companies over to, to talk about how do we get this, this spigot, oil spigot running in your direction. That, that's going to be, I can't imagine being a liberal right now and trying to figure this one out. I mean, there's, yeah, Iran, we want, well, wait a minute. No, Iran is good. No, but we would need to have Iran. No, but Iran can't be a part of the, uh, of the global community because they have oil, but, but Iran needs to be a part of the, the global community so we can stop terrorism. But if they're going to have oil and they're going to be selling the oil, which is going to cause, you know, the United States companies to be there all the time, which means the government's going to be there, which means we're going to continue having people who don't like us, which means there's going to be continue to be terrorism. I can just see their wheels turning right now. They're flipped all upside down and every other which way. They don't know which way to turn. (laughs) Look, they have, the liberals have set this in motion. I don't know what they were thinking. Well, that's the whole point. They weren't thinking. But I don't know what they were thinking when they thought that if they were, if they were going to get Iran to play nice, that we had to play nice with Iran. Well, the only way to play nice for both sides is because Iran wants to sell their oil. Because they don't need it. They produce too much of it. They have a ton of it. Kind of like the United States with, with natural gas. No, we can't possibly use all that that we're pumping out of the ground right now. So we're selling it off. We're becoming the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. So, so this whole notion that, that you know, well, Iran is going to be nice and they're going to play nice, um, but it can't happen without there being some sort of cooperation and cooperation from the West. And that means in order for there to be cooperation and cooperation, Iran has to have something to offer. The only thing Iran, there's two things Iran has to offer as an export in order to lift sanctions. It, they, they've only got two exports, oil and terrorism. That's it. So the whole notion that, that the left thinks that they're going to play nice if we lift sanctions, again, that's a form of religion. They have this faith in that, but it's not going to happen. They're not going to play nice. They've already said they're not going to play nice. That their way of life is the master way and that they need to get rid of Israel. And the way they're going to get rid of Israel is if they build, you know, nuclear weapons. And the way they're going to be able to afford to build nuclear weapons is if they sell us oil. And in order for us to, to, to buy the oil, we've got to be able to refine it and sell it and burn it. So I... I <laughs> I can just, I, these, these poor people, these poor, uh, you know, if nothing else, to be, <laughs> to be that bad in your head, because you're a liberal, you're an idiotic liberal that cannot or does not think logically and does not base your thought process on fact and historical data, is I don't understand how they get out of bed every day. I, I really don't, I don't, I do, yes, I understand living in a fantasy world, but this 
is beyond that. This is they live beyond a fantasy type of lifestyle. I mean, it's it's full blown denial. I don't know how anybody who who's in full blown denial can actually get up every morning, and, you know, and put their pants on and go about doing whatever they're going to do for the day. I mean, other than you know, sitting down and and getting all toked up on an illegal drug. Um, that then, yeah, I can understand how they can be living in a fantasy world with that. But for those who don't partake of such things and are still liberal, I don't understand how they function. I mean, because th- what what is happening in the world today is a, is a blatant slap in their face. You know, take the take the gay issue. You know, hey, we're supposed to, you know, uh, everybody's supposed to treat gays just like straight people. They have the same rights as straight people, blah, 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 and all this kind of yada, yada, yada. You know, gay this, gay that. But when it comes right down to it, they want to also protect Islam. Well, Islam is in du- direct conflict with gays. They still hang and behead gay people. So how do you, how do they reconcile that in their own minds? I, I mean, that goes beyond living in a fantasy world. Because even in a, even living in a fantasy world, there is bits and pieces of, of reality that creeps in. This goes far beyond that. Is there, I don't know what it's called when you live beyond a fantasy world. Uh, it's something deeper than I don't I don't alternate universe I guess. They're living in an alternate plane of existence. Because when, when you look at the left and all they say that they support, well, all that they say that they support is in direct conflict. You know, half of the stuff that they say that they, that they believe in and they support is in direct conflict with the other half of what they say they believe and support. I mean, you, you can't be supportive of gays and, and Islam at the same time. It, they just don't go together. You can't be uh, uh, you can't be supportive of opening up Iran to the rest of the world and having all these companies want to go in and buy their oil. At the same time, you're against global warming. That's a direct conflict. You can't reconcile that. The, the, all of these things that they talk about, they cannot reconcile. Which is why I. Don't, I, you know, I, I try to, I try to understand these people. I I do understand them to a certain degree, but when it comes to them trying to reconcile, it's beyond living in a fantasy world. It really is. I mean, it, 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 it has to, it cannot be anything other than an alternate plane of existence because they're not living on this plane. They're living on some other plane that we don't know about yet. Hey, here's a new story. Judge eviscerates IRS lawyers for arguing they can discriminate based on viewpoints for 270 days. I kid you not. The IRS made an argument to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals on Monday. You know, you're just hearing about this now. Back on Monday, that was so arrogant, so entitled, that the judges declared themselves shocked before they went ahead and uh, eviscerated the IRS and the Justice Department during oral arguments in a case alleging The agency delayed the tax-exempt application of Z Street, a pro-Israel organization. Things got so bad, one judge warned, if I were you, I would go back and ask your superiors whether they want us to represent uh, that the government's position in this case is that the government is free to unconstitutionally uh, discriminate against citizens for 270 days. 270 days they get to discriminate. That's a new one. (laughs) <laughs> hey, but that's, you know, that, hey, that's what the left wants, right? You know, because, hey, you can't, have, you can't have those conservatives out there now. That's just not right. You can't have those, the, the, those conservatives running around believing they can do whatever they want. You know, we have the right to discriminate. But a judge is saying, what are, you, are you out of your living, crazy, freaking mind? And they, yeah, hey, when you got when you got some judges in the D.C. Circuit Court in Washington D.C. who are shocked by this argument, you know you probably got a problem. Well, folks, it's that time of night again. We are out of time. We will be back here tomorrow. So same bat time, same bat channel. 
See you then, folks. Have a wonderful night. I'm Rod Eccles. I'm out.